right.
Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Glad you can make it. Glad Doug's here. Uh, let's stand and worship the Lord for a little while together, shall we?
privilege of being with you and an opportunity for us to worship together. That was very much appreciated. I delighted uh, that your pastor, someone I have a great deal of respect and appreciation for, Pastor Mathis. I'm glad he's getting some time off with his wife in Tennessee today. Uh, I uh, actually bring you greetings from a couple of different entities that, that I'm connected with. Of course, I head up the Baptist Foundation for the State of Illinois, one of our Baptist entities that's a result of our cooperation together. I also serve as pastor of the Together Church on North Grand in North Springfield. And so somebody's actually preaching at my pulpit this morning uh, for me to come and, and, and be with you. I appreciate getting to, to uh, meet several people as I came in. I know uh, uh, Greg greeted me at the door and he gave me a microphone and and as the Hastings uh, uh, overheard, he, he said, he said, now that, that, that microphone will last about eight hours. I, I'm not sure if that was a challenge for you or for me. Uh, but, uh, but, but I should, I should warn you that he is well equipped. One of the things that uh, I know that your pastor shared with me that you all have been emphasizing is on stewardship and, and uh, generosity. And of course, this is what I spend a lot of time speaking about. Uh, and thinking about, writing about, this is what I've discovered is one of the key elements of what a Christian looks like uh, is someone who has had their heart and mind so uh, baptized that they act and they function differently, particularly in the area of stewardship and generosity. In fact, just to make that point, within the scripture, there are over 2,300 2,300 scriptures that deal with finance and stewardship and management. Now, just to put that in perspective, that's more than heaven, hell, and grace combined. And so when we talk about, uh, you know, why do you talk about stewardship in church? Why do you talk about money? Why do you talk about how we manage things? Well, quite frankly, it's very obvious it's because this book talks about it a lot. It is a central theme all the way through. In fact, uh, it's been estimated that about 75% of our time, think, think through this with me, is spent in the making, managing, and, and spending of money. Think through that. Think through your work hours. Think through your planning hours. Think through your hours at a particular store or, or wherever it happens to be. Again, you can see that, that what we do with stuff just impacts a ton of our life. And so I think God understood that. I think he knew that. And so what I want us to do this morning is I want us to begin with Jesus' central teaching. On this particular topic, we're going to be looking at what's commonly called the treasure principle, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at that particular text very closely in just a moment. After that, we're going to see, okay, this is what Jesus said. Now let's see how he applied it. How did he apply this central teaching that he gave? And then after that, we'll see, okay, well, okay, that's how Jesus taught it. That's how he applied it. Now, how did the church apply it? Because one of the very helpful things, I think, one of the reasons we have the book of Acts and we have the epistles that we have after the Gospels is to recognize, okay, this is how church is done. What does it look like? And so we'll actually see in, in some great detail about how the church applied these principles. So I'm going to ask if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read 19 through 24. I'll read from the uh, uh, CSB, the Christian Standard uh, Bible, which is the translation that I have here, but any modern translation you have should not be much different. <coughs> from store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But rather, store up for yourself treasures in heaven, and where thieves don't break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. 
If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is And then he concludes again, Jesus speaking directly. Listen to what he says. No one can serve two masters. Since either he will hate one and he'll love the other. Or he'll be and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's interesting. I told you that this particular text is, I, I, I believe, just essential for us to understand all that Jesus said about this. But we're going to jump from here. We're going to take a look at what this means, the implication of this. And then we're going to look, like I said, at how Jesus applied it in day-to-day life. And then we'll look at his, how his church applied it in some, in some uh, good detail before we finish this morning. But let's pause and pray before we get into the weeds here on this text, okay? Father, thank you so much for these, my friends, for us to worship together you. God, help me to be uh, as your uh, text has suggested, as you've suggested in this the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, where you talk about where we place our treasure, where we place our value, really is important. Lord, help me to respond out of that with a sense of liberty, a sense of gratitude for all that you've done for me. Lord, I pray that as we uh, speak here this morning, that your spirit would be active in the hearts and in the minds of those that are here in Christ. Amen. Excuse me, that's a terrible way to end a prayer, isn't it? (laughs) But when you said bless you, you truly could have meant it. Oh my. Um, From this particular text, I want to suggest to you that money clearly has an eternal perspective. How we use money has an eternal fairly straightforward in this text, right? Because what it says is that uh, where you invest, right? If you if you invest in things that are heavenly, there's one implication, you invest in implication. But again, notice that money, how we spend money, has an eternal perspective. In fact, I want to suggest to you that every money decision that we make, every one of them that we make, is essentially a spiritual decision And reflects your values. It recognizes that God is the owner and we are the stewards, the one who manages what he's given us to manage. In fact, one of the very clear implications of this is that we should be be looking for how we spend God's resources in such a way that we're thinking about timelines. That we're thinking about, let me kind of give you a, a story that kind of illustrates that for just a moment. There was a story that was told about a lady. It was actually in, in south, uh, it would have been southwestern Kentucky, I guess it was. And during the Civil War, during the war between the states, uh, she, had, she was convinced somewhere around uh, uh, early 18, she was convinced still in early 1865 that the South was going to win that war. Now, obviously, if you're in early 1865 and you think the South is going to win the Civil War, you're not paying attention. But that's what she thought. And so it, what she decided to do, in fact, was to, to invest in Confederate dollars. You know what Confederate dollars are? Literally, it was a currency that was issued by the Confederacy. Literally, a separate country set up just to our South and they set up a currency, and they begin to do barter and trade with that currency, just the same way we use greenbacks today. So she was so convinced that the South was going to pull it out there at the end that she began to uh, buy greater and greater quality, quantities of Confederate dollars, believing that they were going to appreciate and actually do well. Well, obviously, by the time the, the January, February, March of 1865 had come along and it was clear that this was going to end in a massive victory for the North, she literally could wallpaper her walls with those Confederate dollars. They were useless. 
Here's my point. It's amazing the number of times that people invest in toys and stuff that is constantly depreciating from here instead of investing in a place we're going to. In fact, with every page you turn over on the calendar or every day that comes across your phone, whatever the ad ever you keep time, what I want to suggest to you is that you're getting one day further from the earth and one day closer to heaven. Why on earth would you not have the orientation of your life investing of where you're going to instead of where you're coming from? The poor lady with the Confederacy never did quite get that truth. But it's absolutely true that many people who try to cling and hold on to things that are, la that, that are going away also don't grasp that truth. Again, we should be able to get it from just some common sense. We look around it at, at uh, you know, you, you, you just very rarely go to a, to, a, to a graveyard and see a storage facility right next to one, right? I mean, we recognize that most people are going to leave it all here, right? And yet in their mind, they begin to hold on to things that are by nature beginning to deteriorate and depreciate instead of investing in things that appreciate. Well, okay, so somebody said, in fact, I remember having somebody being very cute when they said this, uh, how will they, you know, how do you know you're investing in heavenly things? How will you know that where your treasure is and your heart are going to be in the same place? Well, first off, let's talk about that second thing I just said, because it really seems fairly obvious. Now, I remember that, that we, we actually sent our eldest daughter uh, we sent her to Hannibal the Grange University, if anybody knows where, where, where that school is, straight up the river. And uh, we, we, we sent her there. She was in nursing for a, for a time. And, and I got to tell you, I got much more interested in Hannibal the Grange University after I started writing them a few checks. <laughs> we all do the same thing, don't we? Again, where we invest where we put the things that are of value naturally traps our heart. That's Jesus' point, right? If you're in love with your truck, I promise you that's where your mind and your money goes. If you're in love with kingdom things, I promise you that's where your mind and your money goes. Well, what is it that can be possibly investing in heaven? I mean, after all, it's hard to get things going to a forwarding address here. How do we get that done? Well, to, to put it very succinctly, the only thing I know that is durable enough to last from here to eternity is the human soul, is the human heart. And so when I invest in people, when I invest in God's church and the expansion of the kingdom, literally, I can see myself investing in heaven. Does that make sense? To be able to understand it. So I'm able to make a choice between do I invest in those things that I know are depreciating and getting less in value in those things that are getting more to hold. One other thing. If we don't get this right, there's a, there's a bit of a warning in verse 24. If you could go back and take a look at verse 24, you, you'll see it very clearly. Listen to what he says. He says, no one can serve two masters since either he will hate the one or he'll love the other or he'll be devoted to one and he'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Here is the warning that we should be very well aware of. If we do not settle this in our heart, if we have a hoarding mentality, if we trust in things rather than God, all those kind of things that we'll touch on today, but if we do not settle this in our heart, God is saying to you very clearly, you will have a war inside you. You will have a war inside you. You cannot serve two masters, I promise you. It, in fact, <laughs> in, in my life in ministry, I can tell you that some of the most miserable people I've ever known are people that describe themselves 
as Christian, but they're stingy. Christian, but they're stingy. In fact, I'll go so far as to say this. I've never known an unhappy, generous person. Have you? I mean, think of the people that you know that are generous. Literally, it tracks, doesn't it? Where their heart is and their treasure is, same place. It just makes sense. This, this treasure principle gets lived out all the time. Well, that's Jesus' central teaching on this. Let's look and see how he actually applied it. And we can do all of that by looking at a couple of stories in the book of Luke. And so I want you to turn over some from Matthew over to Luke. And we're going to look at a story in Luke 18 and then in Luke 19. So Luke 18, and then we'll go right, right next to Luke 19, where I believe the gospel writer put these stories together on purpose. But what we'll discover is that money has incredible power over so many people, over so many people. Certainly in our culture, we see that all the time. Perhaps it's a struggle that you have in your own life. I don't know. But, but I do know this, that it has incredible power in this gospel. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 25. This is, sometimes people will call this, this uh, the rich young ruler. Uh, but you'll, you'll see why here. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Because no one is good except God alone. Again, an opportunity for Jesus to be questioned and for him to deflect the glory on his father. He did it all the time. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. But what's he doing? He's literally going back and reading the Ten Commandments to him, right? So check, 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 all the way down through there. And he said, well, all these I've kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all you have. And distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Hear that? Hear that? Hear that phrase? Treasure in heaven should should be ringing a bell, right? We just saw that in Matthew chapter six. And you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, "How difficult it is for those who have wealth." To enter the kingdom of God. Wow. Does that give anybody heartburn at all? I mean, it should. Right? How difficult it is for somebody that has wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says something a little bit humorous. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who heard it said, well, then who can be saved? And he said, well, what is impossible with man is indeed possible with God. Let's look at the sobering truth here just a moment. This guy we just read about, we pass away, we go home, we will not see him again. Literally, literally, his desire to hold on to things that were temporary was so powerful that he could not exchange that for something eternal. Do you see that? It was an incredible power that he had, that, 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 that wealth, that money, and his love of that had over his life. So much so that literally Jesus said, it is tough for the wealthy to actually become citizens of heaven. Well, that's the negative side. That's a negative story, right? Again, we will not see this guy uh, in heaven unless something happened after that. Zacchaeus. I, I don't know if you've... Do, has anybody, anybody here been in church for longer than you know, maybe 30, 40 years? It's okay. You can admit it. If you have been, remember the old Vacation Bible School song that we used to sing about Zacchaeus, right? And remember Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he and, you know... And, Kind of the whole sycamore tree. Yes, some of you were singing it already. I get it. Uh, but and I can remember, you know, there's that there's that line for some reason 
Jesus always shakes his finger when he says, you come down under the tree, all that stuff that's there. Well, this is that story. And so what we're going to see is that that story is less about what's going on with uh, bringing a tax collector out of a tree than what happens in the tax collector's home afterwards. Take a look with me at chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was, but on account of the crowd, he could all in stature. See, the song was right. And look what happened. And when Jesus came to the place, they and said to him, excuse me, so of course, those were holding on to this guy so much that he missed the kingdom of heaven. In chapter 19, we see a guy who repudiates that and instead places his faith in Christ. And because of that, he reacts with generosity and he gains the kingdom of heaven. It's hard to have too big a contrast than that, isn't it? It's interesting, before you can really truly understand this particular text, you really need to understand just a little bit of the story of tax collectors and what was really going on there at the time. Tax collectors were known to be on the grift. They were oftentimes, they would be cheating somebody else out. In fact, if they were supposed to collect one denarius, one day's wages, they would often collect two and pocket one. And so absolutely this guy had been cheating and gaming the system. But what occurred here, what literally happened, is that as he has an encounter with Christ, his view of possessions, his view of what he held, was changed permanently. So much so that he says, well, my first reaction is, I'll, I'll give away half these possessions. And in fact, then he, then he says, well, if I have defrauded anyone, I told you kind of wink, wink, of course he's defrauded somebody, he would restore it fourfold. And the result of that is that Christ saw faith in him. In fact, it reminds me of an Old Testament text that you probably know. Is, uh, it's an old psalm that says something... To this effect, it said, Psalm 40, if my memory serves, it says something like, some will trust in horses, some will trust in chariots, but I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. Somewhere he decided that he would no longer put his confidence in the resources he had, but he would put his confidence in Jesus. And that made all the difference in the world for Zacchaeus. All right, so I've already kind of signposted as we went through, right? We talked about the central teaching in Matthew chapter 6, the treasure principle. We looked at how Jesus applied it. And some of you may be saying, okay, well, I get how Jesus applies his own stuff. I can get that. But what about you and me? How can we learn, how can we see how we apply what Jesus did? Well, I think the best place to do that is let's just go back and let's look how the church did it before us. Let's look at others that are Christ followers. How did they apply this? Before we go any further, let me just tell you that it seems like this entire generosity conversation is really, really a response to the very nature and character of God. Let me tell you why. The most famous verse that we all know, those of us who are disciples of Christ, those of us who are working to follow the Lord, has to be John 3.16, right? And so help me with that. Say that kind of with me. For God so loved the world that he gave. Stop, stop right there. The very nature of God is wrapped up in his generosity, his willingness to give. That's it. And so what the church was going to do is to simply reflect that kind of generous heart 
that kind of generosity in everything that they did. So let's take a look at that, just up front and close and personal. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, and you'll see that in very clear relief. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 44 through 46. And what you'll see is that generosity becomes the norm. It becomes a way of life in the early church as a response to grace, as a response to a God who gave to them. So chapter 2, verses 44 through 46. All who believed, and the church was growing rapidly during this time, all who believed were together and had all things in common. So again, they got rid of the mine. They got rid of this is mine exclusively. Uh, in fact, I, 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 was, I was playing with a dear friend of mine, uh, and we, we, were, we were having a conversation about some things that I had in my barn. Uh, I have a small farm just north of, of, of Springfield, and, and, and we said, you know what? God owns a ladder, and for right now, he's storing it in my barn. You're welcome to use it anytime. Again, you can hear how it truly does change our language, doesn't it? How we change, how we live. And so, and all who believed were together and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. You see what they were doing? They were applying the treasure principle, weren't they? And they, they, they were saying, these things that are temporary, I'm going to move from that to invest in people that are permanent. Right? So they, they were making that, that switch. They were making that transition. And day by day, excuse me, they were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes and received their food with glad and generous hearts. Wow. <laughs> the church began and generosity broke out. Now, some of you have been around long enough that you know that that is the way of the church. Uh, in fact, one of the things I oftentimes talk to people about is I, I, I was sharing with them my first church pastor. I was, oh goodness, I was a kid. I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was licensed to preach when I was 16. I was ordained at 19 or 20. I was pastoring my first church, and, and I had just gotten married. And uh, so here I am, a young husband, and my wife and I are celebrating my first birthday at the church where I'm pastoring. Well, she's excited about it. My wife was fixing my favorite meal, which still is spaghetti. And uh, so she was fixing that for me, and she set that down in front of me. I'll never forget, we were in the parsonage of this church where I was pastoring, which was a double-wide trailer out in back of the back of the church house. And, and, and I was pastoring there. She sits it down in front of me, and the phone rings. Obviously, this is, this is just a little bit before cell phone, so it was a corded phone that was ringing. But, but I picked it up, and it was a guy that was out at the truck stop that had broken down, and he was wanting some assistance. And I remember that my first impulse was to be a little bit irritated about that, irritated for me and irritated for my wife. And then the Lord remind me, reminded me, be grateful that their first call was to the people of God. You see, in truth, the world understands that when the God changes our heart, he changes our intent toward generosity our intent toward loving others well. And that's exactly how the church reacted here. In fact, I can, I can make that case even more boldly if you look down the page, chapter 4, verses 32 through 37, you'll see it even more critically here. Um, another text that's talking about the growth of the church. Listen to what's going on. Chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. Wow. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. And there was not a needy person among them. 
For as many who were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means some encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money that laid it at the apostles' feet. That is not insignificant because Barnabas, who was a key player in the rise of the early church, a key aide to Paul and certainly Luke, and he came to the church by a way of generosity. Let's go to the end of the book. Let's go to the end of Acts. And what we're going to see is the words of an old man before he dies. And I, I think maybe the older I get, the more interested I am in old people's writings. But Paul said he was writing to people that he had influenced now the rest of his adult life. He's just about to lead them. In fact, he's, he's talking to a group in Ephesus that he believes he will never see again. And it's interesting when, when, when people are just about to die, let's imagine that you have a loved one or somebody that you're working with that uh, just about to die in the hospital or something, and they call the family in, right? They use that euphemism, and we all go into the family. While you're there having that kind of conversation, you typically don't talk about how the cardinals are doing or what the weather's like outside. You typically talk about things of importance, right? Things that are of a critical nature. And so when somebody is writing right before they leave you, it's good to pay attention. It's kind of like Jesus on his way out said, well, let me give you a great commission. Paul is saying this in Luke, or excuse me, in Acts 20. Verse Slip of the tongue, Luke most likely wrote the book of Acts. But listen to what's going on. By the way, this is the only recorded time where we have his words exactly, except for the Gospels in the book of Revelation, is right here. In words, I did not live my life oriented after things. You yourselves know with these hands, verse 34, ministered to my necessities and to those who... Last stop. Again, Paul. This time writing to young Timothy. Someone that chapter six is the last part of the first book that he wrote in the first epistle uh, to uh, this individual that he would have influence over all of his life. And, and, and he wrote, it's interesting, listen to what he wrote. It was, it was, it was, both, it was both a warning and a promise of generosity. Listen to what he says. Um, chapter six, I'll read 17 through 19. Again, Paul speaking to young Timothy. Listen to what he says. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, but on God, who richly provides to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Verse 29, we're going to wrap it up. Look at this. Look, look, look at how on this whole teaching. Verse Storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Chapter 6, verse 19. Verse 19. Uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 19. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're good. You're good. 1 Timothy 6, 19, literally saying to us that unless they learn how to do this, they will never be able to take hold of life in his life. Do you remember what Jesus said at the end, verse 24 of chapter 6? You remember when you have a war in your soul? And here we see that if you will do this, if you will adopt a life that is oriented toward generosity, you will be able to grab hold of the very best that life has to offer. I told you about 20 minutes ago that I've never seen an unhappy, generous person. 
That's true. In fact, Paul would even later on write, God loves a cheerful giver. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that when we give, we release what is here. When we invest in people, we invest in what is there. And we recognize that we do all of it in response to the generous God who first gave to you and to me. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your kindness and your generosity. Lord, we love you. The best that we can do is to give you our life. Lord, there are some undoubtedly that are here that are still clinging to idols that they built here on the earth. Remind them, Lord, of the folly of that. Remind them, Lord, how so. Free them, Lord, from good life, taking hold of life that is truly life by being generous. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing here in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, is it okay to ask maybe deacons or, or a deacon to come forward with me? Is that, is that okay? Somebody, if you're a deacon, would you come and stand here with me? Um, is it Jeremy? Is that right? Okay. I appreciate it. One of the things that I have learned, and I speak of quite often in, in my own pulpit, is that when we get to the end here of a service, what we're doing is we're really asking the so what question. The so what question, right? In other words, God's been speaking. We've been examining scripture. We've been understanding what this has to be from Jesus' teaching to his application to the church's application. And what's he saying to you? So what? What will you do with what you've heard? Some of you who have never met this Jesus, the one who was so generous that he gave, literally he gave his life for you. I don't know of generosity that exceeds that, do you? So what? Or that God who has given to you and you have an opportunity to follow him, how is it changing your life? Or are you simply holding on to things that are passing away with every day? This is the so what question. I'm going to ask you to respond as God's Spirit leads you to do. Let's stand and sing together, okay? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me. Oh.
received one of these. This is what we call a life stewardship navigator. And it's a tool that the foundation actually built a few years ago, but it's designed to help Christians who are putting together a Christian estate plan where they can help both heirs, both people they want to bless, children perhaps, or, or those they want to give physical gifts to, and kingdom causes. And so if that's you, if, if, if that's you saying, you know what, Lord, I do think that's the right thing to do, then let me encourage you just to begin to read this. Read this, begin to take some notes in it, and if that's something that you would like for the foundation to help you with, free of charge, free of charge, we will come and we will do that uh, for you in a confidential manner. And so we actually help, we, we've helped about 300 families across our state, those kinds of things uh, that we do, but that's a service that you have, and I encourage you to, to look at how you can see through these principles we've been talking about today. Again, thank you so much. Turn it back to you. <laughs> I'm dismissed. Have a great day. <laughs>